All right, welcome everybody to Paleo Talks, episode 18. We were having some technical difficulties, uh, but we're now over on YouTube, so hopefully you're there and joining us. Uh, with us today is Dr. Sharon Weaver. Used to be Sharon Holte. Say hi, Sharon. Hello. <laughs> so it's a real pleasure to be talking about the mammoth site uh, with Dr. Weaver today. And um, she's sharing some too, because she was I've known her a very long time and was one of our graduate students here as well. Uh, but before we get started, David, if you want to uh, chime in again with sort of the, the overview of what we're going to do. Absolutely. We are following the standard Paleo Talks format. Um, uh, we had some technical issues with Facebook live streaming today. So unfortunately, that wasn't working out. So we're running a little bit late. Uh, we're streaming over on YouTube. This will be up, as with all the other Paleo Talks. Uh, the, the video will, the recording will be up on YouTube. So if you miss part of it, you can check it out there. But standard format, we're going to have our guest give their presentation for the you know, 25, 30 minutes, at which point we're going to remind everybody watching us to start asking questions. And the rest of the presentation will be questions from the audience. So if you're here on YouTube, you can leave your questions in the comment section next to the video. And if you can't comment on YouTube, you can still send us a message on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, find us at the Gray Fossil site. I'll be keeping an eye on those too, so that hopefully we don't miss anybody. All right, thank you, David. Uh, coming to you today from Johnson City, Tennessee, East Tennessee State University and the Center of Excellence in Paleontology, again with Dr. Sharon Weaver. Uh, I'm Blaine Schubert, one of the hosts, and let's just move on forward and start going here. Uh, and this is sort of the storytelling time, the beginning part, Sharon, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into paleontology in the first place. And I know it has something to do with the Mammoth site. And then where you went to school and what led you to being at the Mammoth site again? Okay. Uh, so I have been interested in paleontology since I was like two or three years old. Uh, my parents took me to the Science Museum of Minnesota and I saw a dinosaur skeleton and that just started me off on a whole series of questions. Um, and I was just super enthralled and enthused with dinosaurs. And, you know, at a young age, every most kids go through that little dinosaur phase. And so everybody kept telling me and my parents that I would grow out of it. And I just was like, nope, nope, no, I'm not going to. I'll prove you wrong kind of thing. And so I had always been like super excited about paleontology. And so my parents tried to encourage that as much as they could. They would take me out. They heard of an archeological dig in Minnesota. They'd take me out to go visit it. And then about the age of 12, my family decided to take a family vacation out to the Black Hills. And in doing so, we got this little advertisement book about the Black Hills. And there was a little tiny ad about the size of a quarter in this booklet about a place called the Mammoth Site. And it's saying it's an active paleontology dig. And I was like, yes, can we go there? And so the entire trip so it's like about a nine, 10 hour drive from where I lived uh, out to the Black Hills. I kept asking if we could stop there. Uh, so I annoyed my parents, I think more than enough. <laughs> and we decided to take a tour of the Mammoth site. And in, during the tour, I had the brochure and I was looking through the brochure and on the back, it had a picture of what the principal scientist, the lead chief scientist at the site, Dr. Larry Agenbrod. And it described how he was in charge of all the paleontology done at the Mammoth site. And I looked up and I saw him walking around. And so I decided to go over and introduce myself. And now working at the Mammoth site, you can imagine there's a number of young children that come up and say, hey, I'm interested in paleontology. I would like to come back and dig. And that's the very thing I did to Larry, as I said, you know, I'm super excited about fossils. I've always been, I've, you know, what can I do? What can I do? And he said, well, come back next summer and dig. And at the time, the, the rules were a little bit different. Um, and so I came back at 13 as a volunteer. And then the next summer I was on, through like a scholarship, I came back. And then the summer after that, I was hired. 
and now this summer celebrates 19 years of me being associated with the mammoth site in some way. So it's pretty great. Um, when I decided to go on for school, I asked Dr. Agenbrod, where should I start looking? And he suggested South Dakota School of Mines and Technology, which was in Rapid City. It was an, it's an hour north of the mammoth site, roughly. And I went there and did a bachelor's degree in geology with a specialization in paleontology. And then when it came to, hey, I should start looking at master's programs, Larry suggested, oh, well, my colleague, Jim Mead, went out to Tennessee and working on a new program in Tennessee for paleontology. You should talk to Jim about that. Well, I had met Jim at 15 at the site, so I was familiar with who he was. And I ran into him at SVP and Jim's like, oh, but you don't want to work on squamates, do you? And I'm like, mm, not so much. I kind of like mammals. He's like, well, you should talk to Blaine then. And so he ran me over and introduced me to Blaine. And uh, I started my master's working with Blaine at ETSU. I studied giant ground sloths from a cave in Alabama. And from there, uh, we did a lot of research at the University of Florida, Florida Museum of Natural Histories collections. Uh, and I met my PhD advisor, Dr. Dave Sedman. Uh, and I started a program there. I took me a few years to get a PhD, but I worked on the carnivorans and looked at uh, the upper arm bones of carnivorans, comparing modern carnivores to fossil carnivores using 3D scans, so 3D geometric morphometric analyses. And I also, throughout my time with my master's and my PhD, was heavy, heavily involved in education and outreach and used all of those things to kind of put together a decent resume for applying to the MAMA site. So now I work at the MAMA site as curator um, I oversee the bone bed, the prep lab collections. Um, I work heavily, oh, I also oversee what we're calling the Turner Geospatial Center, which is a 3D imaging center. Um, we do some ArcGIS work as well. And I run the internship program and help with the Division of Education, as well as um, developing a new field station at the MAMA site going forward. So I am in paleontology, but I have fingers in all different kinds of aspects of paleontology. That's well, thank a, you. That's quite a path. Yeah. <laughs> I think my, uh, my first experience at the Mammoth site was 1994, and that's when I met Jim and Larry, and I was actually on my way to Arizona to work with them both in the program. And so my master's was with Jim and Larry, and so we're a very inbred group, that's for sure. Yes. <laughs> if you will go ahead and move to your, your first slide. Sure. And then uh, go ahead and put it in presentation. There we go. And we'll just start working our way through it. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about ongoing research at the MAMA site. So I'm going to kind of get into what is the MAMA site? How did we get to the state that we're in? What our current research goals are? And where are we going in the future? So the MAMA site is a 501c3 nonprofit. We consider ourselves an educational and scientific research institution. And we are funded, funded mainly by tourism. So on a typical summer, not this summer, uh, we see about 100 and 2,000 visitors a year, and about 96% of those visitors are between the months of June and August. Um, so tourism coming through the site is our major funding source. We do have memberships, um, collect donations, and we apply for grants, and typically most of our grants are coming from corporate and family foundations, though we're trying to get into more um, research grants opportunities as well. Uh, we are governed by a board of directors, and that kind of oversees everything we do at the MAMA site. So the MAMA site is located in Hot Springs, South Dakota. That is on the very southern edge of the Black Hills. So we're about an hour south of Rapid City and about 45 minute drive from Mount Rushmore. And the site itself formed um, 
as a cave underground. So it's one of those situations where you have groundwater coming up, dissolving limestone, forming that cavern. That cavern enlarges over time. When it becomes so large, it collapses inward. And being in Hot Springs, South Dakota, we have numerous warm water springs. And in this particular cavern that collapsed, we had an artesian spring or two that kind of filled it up with water. Now, this image that I'm showing here is our traditional view of how the mammoth site would have looked back in the Ice Age. However, current research is kind of suggesting it was more of this kind of situation where there was a more of a shallow edge to the water, to a larger pond with a very deep section, the sinkhole section. And so we think that mammoths may have been able to walk into the water a bit and then gone into the deeper edge of the sinkhole and then were unable to get out. And the reason why they're unable to get out is because of the spearfish shale layer. This spearfish shale is very slippery when wet and having these very steep edges with this very slick rock, it was very hard for those very large animals, gravity portal animals, to get themselves out of the sinkhole. If you think of a mammoth, they have very round columnar legs with very flattened feet with not much traction. And the way their body weight is distributed against their um, mass, it was very hard for them to kind of climb back over the edge. So we think that once they went into this deeper water, maybe to go swimming, maybe to get some grass, maybe they slipped in, that they were just unable to get back out. So over time, that sink hill filled in with sediments. Near the top sections of the mammosite sediments, we actually see footprints when, from when mammoths could easily walk across the sinkhole. And these sediments filled in and hardened, and they actually became harder than the sediments on the outer edges and then that spearfish shale. So what we get is something called reverse topography. We go from having a hole in the ground to now having a hill because those soft sediments on those edges are eroding away, creating this hilltop feature of those hardened sediments that were inside the sinkhole. So Sharon, I just want to comment for just a second for everybody out there. Uh, remember, we're, we're coming to you from the gray fossil site region and where the gray fossil site is, and we're a five million year old site. And we are essentially talking about the same kind of fossil formation. Yeah. So here's pictures that you guys use to describe the gray fossil site. It's again, a sinkhole situation. We're creating this kind of hole in the ground that becomes kind of a pool that these animals are, are allowed to get into, right? And so we see this quite often. Sinkholes become a very good natural trap for animals and are a great way of preserving fossils for the future. My dissertation site in Florida was also another sinkhole event, but even older, eight, Thomas Farm, which is about 18 and a half million years old. So this is a, a great kind of natural trap environment for us paleontologists to really look at and excavate to get a picture of what was going on um, back in time. So in 1974, this hill was in an area of hot springs that they wanted to build a housing complex. So in the process of wanting to build this housing complex, they had this nasty hill in the way. And so the developers wanted to come in and start shaving that hill down so they could have a nice flattened land to put in beautiful homes. But in the process of doing that, they began to run into bones and things that were kind of unusual. And being in southern or western South Dakota, this is a very big ranching community area. Uh, those people that were working on this property realized that these bones were not the typical bones that they would see on a ranch. They're not bison, they're not cow, they're not horse. This is something different. And so they reached out to Dr. Larry Agenbrod and Jim Mead at Northern Arizona University and said, we have something unique here, please come and look. And so Jim came up with a crew and they started excavating and they realized that they had mammoth bones there. 
And they told the guys, yeah, we'll come in, we'll clear these bones for you and you can keep building your housing complex. But what they didn't realize until they started working was that there was one mammoth, there was two mammoths, there was three mammoths and this site just started growing and growing and growing. So skeleton- Karen, skeleton. just to interrupt you and if you could go back for just a minute, if you could point sure. out Jim Mead there. Oh, Jim is the one without a shirt in the bottom section, <laughs> little picture. <laughs> Most of the pictures we have of Jim from the 70s seems to be lacking a shirt. I don't know. <laughs> Looking good. Yeah. And the other thing to note is the, the awning in the upper picture was donated from the funeral home. Nice. So that was, yeah, that was handy. <laughs> <laughs> and so they realized that there was so many mammoths here that it wasn't going to be a salvage opportunity like they this was something that was important this was something that was unique and they had to find a way to save it so that's how, why they decided to create the nonprofit, the mammoth site um, at this point they had many mammoths, I can't remember how many they had found. Um, today, we are up to 61, depending on who you talk to, 61 mammoths at the mammoth site, most of which are Colombian mammoths, uh, which are larger than woolly mammoths. And this is based on number of tusks that we have found. So we take the number of tusks and we divide it by two. And as we excavate, we continue to find more. So, so far we're at 61, which is pretty great, which means it's the largest concentration of Columbia mammoths in the entire world. And there's some unique challenges to the site because we tried to leave as much as we can in place, which creates um, difficulties with trying to preserve things and deciding what stays, what goes, what needs extra help, what and how to handle certain things such as sediments drying out. Uh, we have a building over top of the site and that building is temperature and humidity controlled, but you know, at what level do we have to keep the humidity controlled and, and figuring out how much humidity and what temperature is gonna be best for keeping these things in place. When you get skeletons that are completely laid out and articulated like this one in the, the picture here, like it loses some value to it when you remove it and put it down into collections. So we wanna keep as much as we can in place. So in 2016, Jim B came back to the site, um, taking over from Larry Agenbrod. And right around then is when we decided to kind of shift gears a little bit more and become a full-fledged research and educational institution. We want to look at more than just mammoths, more than just the mammoth site and really expand into the world of paleontology in the Black Hills. So what are some of the things that we started doing to prepare for the future? Well, we started to really evaluate what bones at the site we need to leave in place, what bones may need a little bit more care, and what direction we want the site to look and to grow. So we've been updating exhibits at the site. Um, all throughout. So if you haven't been in the last two years, I suggest going again. Uh, we've put in new railing system all around. So the chain link fence, if you've ever been there before, the chain link fence is now completely gone. Unlike this picture, which is a kind of a little bit older one, but we've added also an elevator system. So it makes it a lot easier for accessibility. And we put in new stairs coming in. So these stairs are actually normal step height, which was kind of a challenge before and super narrow before. Uh, so with those kind of components, we're trying to make it more accessible to everybody. And with COVID, we've taken steps to address COVID. So we suggest that people keep a tusk length apart. Um, we've gone away from guided tours to self-guided tours. So we have an app that people use and we have put up signage across the bone bed to supplement the app. So it's additional information, but it also attracts different types of museum goers. So in my understanding of museum goers, in my um, education, I have learned that there are three different types of museum goers to 
just like an oversimplification, but you have what we call your streakers, your strollers, and your studiers. You have the people that race through exhibits and want just the basic information of what this presenting to them. You have the strollers who are going to read a little bit more and then you have the studiers who are going to sit there and learn every little aspect. So we're trying to um, reach out to all different types of museum goers at the site. We also a couple years ago discovered that we have a second giant short face bear at the site, which Blaine and I are going to be hopefully working on, right Blaine? That's right. That's right. Yep. We already we already made big progress on that. So, and that's super exciting. Uh, we're currently excavating in the area where we tend to find most of the bare bones uh, at the site. So hopefully in the next couple months, maybe we'll see if we can find it, some more things. Um, and then we've started to take a look at what our science has been at the site and where our science could go. So. The site was originally dated to about 26,000 years old, and that was done on bone appetite analysis in, I think, the early 80s, late 70s. And the state never really sat well with the type of tax that we were finding, and it just, it just didn't feel right. Uh, and so a couple of years back, we had Dr. Shannon Mayhem from the USGS in Denver come out and date the sediments directly. Instead of dating the fossils themselves, we wanted to date the sediments. So our fossils, the bones were sitting in that warm water. We see a lot of minerals um, and we see a lot of, I guess, the biological aspects of the bones leached out. And so we don't have very much mineral replacement in the bones. They're very delicate. And so we felt like looking at the sediments themselves, we could get a more accurate date. And so we did something that's relatively new in the dating world is called optically stimulated luminescence dating. And this looks at quartz and feldspar grains in the rock. And so basically a simple oversimplification of how to look at this is when quartz or feldspar is covered up, when it's not exposed to sunlight, a stopwatch starts and it starts ticking. And the moment that it, that crystal is exposed to sunlight again, it zeroes it out. So if you could take a look at that crystal before it's exposed to sunlight, you can look to see how long that crystal has been buried. And so that's what we did. We looked at the bottom of where we've excavated to and near the top of, of our bone bed. And so our new dates that we have are about 140,000 years old at the top and near to the bottom of where we've excavated, we're around 190,000 years ago. So that means in that section, that 20 some feet, we have 50,000 years of sediment being deposited. 50,000 years of a, a picture being snapped here at the Mammoth site. And keep in mind that at that 190,000 mark, we still have another 45 more feet to go. And just a couple weeks ago, Shannon Mahan, who is in the left-hand picture, came back out with a colleague and they came, took more samples going up. But these samples, they were looking at five centimeter sections and they're gonna start looking at um, sulfur isotopes, sulfur and oxygen, I believe, isotopes. And they're gonna start trying to get at what was the, the composition of the water what kind of temperature do we have here at the site to see if we can start getting at finer details and see if we can get any kind of transitionary periods or ideas of what's actually happening with the water table at the mammoth site. So if you look at the time that the mammoth site is, so that 190,000 to 140,000, what we're capturing is a full glacial period. And so can we start to see that full glacial? Can we start to see those fluctuations in those five centimeter segments as we go up? So this is really important for us to kind of get at what's going on climatically in the Black Hills region. So this is just basically the start of where we're going with mammocyte research on the mammocyte. Um, we are starting to literally look at the geology 
and really look at other taxa here that we have. Um, if we kind of stop and take a moment and we look, well, mammoths are very, are everywhere. You're gonna trip over a mammoth at the mammoth site, but we have 80 other species of animals and plants that we are aware of that come out of the mammoth site. So we need to really start looking at those. We need to look at the, the climate and the geology of what's actually going on. So these are all new things that we're starting to do. So to follow us and figure out what's going on, what's new, is we do have Facebook posts, we do have Instagram posts. Um, we try to post new information on our website as well. So Blaine, do you have any questions for me hmm. here at the MAMA site? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and so we're sort of wrapping up the, the first part of the presentation here with the MAMA site talk. And you know, one of the things that I do want to emphasize is it's clear what a big impact it had on your life. And I think it has an impact on everybody who visits. So if you haven't been able to visit the MAMA site, certainly do. And if you have a kid that wants to be a paleontologist, it's a must, must see. Uh, there's no question about that. But as we- Yeah, we have summer programming for kids. Um, we're looking at building um, like a summer camp kind of thing, a day summer camp for children for next summer. So we're kind of testing the waters on that. Uh, we have junior paleontology and advanced paleontology excavation classes for children. We're gonna have an adolato class for children next summer as well. And then we have adult dig programs, uh, volunteer programs that adults can part participate in. And then we're looking at expanding all different kinds of other educational stuff going forward. So again, there just aren't very many places in the world where you can actually go and see the fossils still in place. And the mammoth site, that's one of the unique aspects of that. But when we talk about the small animals and what else is going on in the region, you know, I, that comes to some of the other studies that I know that you all are starting to work on and work on more heavily. Um, before we get into that though, I know it's about time to remind the audience, David, that they should be sending in their questions and how do they do that, David? That's right. So if you have questions uh, for us to ask Sharon, go ahead and start leaving those questions in the comment section of the YouTube video. So there should be the comments, uh, the chat next to the video. If you're not able to leave comments or questions on YouTube, feel free to head over to the Gray Fossil site on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram and send us messages there. And I'll be keeping an eye on those as well. Uh, we do have a question already to start us off with, unless you had more you wanted to say, Blaine. So, so yeah, I think uh, what we'll do is Sharon does have a little bit more and that, that leads us into looking at the other fauna that are in the Black Hills, looking at cave sites and things like that. And so go ahead and start that, Sharon. And then David will start uh, feeding in questions as we go. So one of the research objectives of the MAMA site is to get a better understanding of the Ice Age in the Black Hills. And so to get a bigger, more well-rounded picture of what's going on, we need to start looking at other sites. And one of the best places to look for other Ice Age sites in the Black Hills is looking at caves. So. What I've learned recently is that there are over 400 caves in the Black Hills itself. And caves are a perfect place to start looking at snapshots of what's going on. Uh, not only because of sediments are typically undisturbed, but it also creates a nice, um, typically you have some kind of stratigraphy going on. So you can start to dig back through time in caves as well. So one of the caves that we have been actively working at is called Persistence Cave. And this is within Wing Cave National Park. So we have been um, actively looking at the sediments and taking those sediments out for those micro um, fossils. So this cave is kind of a picture about where the cave is. Um, as Jim would say, just enough poison ivy for fun around the entrance of the cave. Um, it's a relatively small hole with about an eight foot drop and then it kind of splits off into two tunnels. One side um, they have been actively digging through and trying to connect to see if this persistence cave connects to wing cave um, itself. There's a lot of 
what they call airflow coming out of the cave. And that typically tells you that a cave is, um, the amount of airflow will tell you about how long a cave could be. Um, and so there's idea that maybe persistence is connected to wind. So they're going down that direction. A lot of our initial excavations at the Mammosite from Mammosite personnel at Persistence Cave was down the other tunnel. And since, since the cave was discovered, they have now put a gated entrance over top and that's to prevent people from kind of going in and wandering in. But the way the cave gate is designed does allow for bats and other animals to get in and out. This cave acts as a hibernaculum for rattlesnakes. So if you are gonna go into the cave, one of the things that you really need to watch out for are rattlesnakes. Um, I was always encouraging Jim to uh, be the first one to just kind of peek in before I would go in and excavate because ideally I do not want to meet a rattlesnake face to face. Um, this cave is pretty tight. It has very horizontal low passageways so you are army crawling through the cave. Now this is my cave gear before I knew better idea of what cave gear should look like for this situation. So I wasn't really well planned out with our, um, elbow pads and knee pads, which I do now. So uh, the amount of bruises that I got um, excavating was quite numerous, but this is a very, it's a cold cave. It's a wet cave. Um, and usually that doesn't bother a caver because they're moving, but when you're sitting in one spot and excavating, it can get pretty chilly. And you have a, a fashionable mask on before it was in fashion. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so I opted for a mask when doing this because uh, a lot of the sediments is pretty dry and loose. Um, there was also a lot of guano in the sediments. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really want to breathe, be breathing it in. There was also um, pack rat dung as well as a red squirrel that lived in the cave for some reason. I recall one day where I uh, spent all morning in the cave and came out for lunch and then was followed by a red squirrel out that ran up the park service personnel's leg and out yeah. the cave. I was like, yeah, red squirrels can be pretty aggressive. Uh, <laughs> but before we go farther, let's check in with David to see what questions we have that might be building. And then David, just come back to me if, if you need more questions. David, do you have a question? I'm sorry, what was that, Blaine? I was just I was just noting that let's pause for a second so you can ask any questions that have come up so far about the mammoth site or about the cave's aspect. Sure thing. We've got a few questions here about mammoths specifically. Oh geez. <laughs> <laughs> so Grant has asked, uh, what does the teenage male composition of mammoths at the site tell us about the life behavior of Colombian mammoths? Okay, yeah, I didn't really get into that, did I? Uh, so at the mammoth site, all the pelvis, pelvi that we have found um, that are complete, we're able to measure and determine if it's male or female. So all the complete ones suggest that we have only male individuals at the mammoth site. Now, the idea behind that is that we believe that mammoths lived in matriarchal societies like elephants do today, which means a female run society. So Elephants will be run by a primary like grandmother. Um, then you have the mothers that take care of the children and they're all together in a herd. And when a young male mammoth reaches sexual maturity, they get tend to get kicked out of the herd. So they go out on their own or in small bachelor herds, which are groups of three to five mammoths or elephants. And so they don't really have the knowledge base of what is a good idea and what is a bad idea um, from the elders in their group. So they tend to make uh, less desirable decisions. And so we believe that's probably why we have um, mostly young male mammoths. And when I say young, I think roughly early 20s is what we see for about an average. Now we do have one individual that is late 30s, early 40s, and he's our most complete specimen that we have at the site. Uh, and he's at that 190,000 year mark down at the bottom of where we've excavated to. So we do see a little bit of an age range, but typically we see a young male in his early 20s. All right. All right. Here's another question from Barbara who asks, 
uh, do both male and female mammoths have tusks? Yes, they do. So a mammoth tusk is actually a modified front incisor, so your front teeth. Um, and so they come out of a two socket called, called an aviolus and they are ever growing. So these tusks grow throughout the life of the individual. And a mammoth or elephant can be right tusk or left tusk. So like we're right-handed or left-handed. And sometimes you can kind of see that based on how their tusk has been worn down. Um, some mammoths and elephants will also like wrap their trunks over their tusks. So you'll see like a worn part on the tusk from where their trunk was kind of hanging over. Uh, but yes, both males and females have um, tusks. All right, I know Sharon that you do have some cave stuff you wanna talk about. So uh, David, feel free to jump in when the questions start to build up. But if you wouldn't mind Sharon, just sort of zipping through some of the, the cave slides. Sure. So uh, we can get indications of where old entrances were, and that's kind of where we're seeing talus piles inside the cave where we're excavating from. We'll take sediments out and we'll screen wash for microfossils and we'll come across things such as terrestrial snails, which can tell us a lot about um, environment. Um, we also get tons of micro bones. So we see thousands of fossils of these micro animals. And this takes a considerable amount of time to kind of pick through and identify these specimens, but we're starting to see some really interesting things. We see, start to find animals that are not in the Black Hills today, um, but we see ones that are in the local region. So for example, this lizard will, we can find in Nebraska and Wyoming, but we don't see in the Black Hills today, but it tends to be more drier. So that's suggesting, hey, at this time, maybe it was more drier. Um, again, we see lots of different snakes and that was to be expected because it is the rattlesnake hibernaculum. We get carnivore bones. Um, we start to see a sm other small carnivores, the pine marten, I'll kind of bring up again in a little bit, but they, we think that maybe we're not sure if it was here historically or not, but it was definitely reintroduced to the Black Hills. We find a lot of bat teeth and bat bones and you can say, well, it's a cave, of course you're going to find bats. Well, bats weren't really known from this cave uh, until we started opening it up again. So these were bats that were from a long time ago, the cave closed down, bats didn't come in, and now we've opened up the entrance and now we're seeing bats come in again. Uh, one interesting thing that we see at this cave and we also see at the mammoth site is that we find prairie dog and a lot of people are like, well, Black Hills, of course you find prairie dog. But what's neat is that we find the white tail prairie dog in the fossil record and not the black tail. And the big difference between the two is white tail prairie dogs hibernate and black tailed prairie dogs do not. So is this suggesting that it was a lot colder at this point to where they could hibernate um, or needed to hibernate and the black tail couldn't make it in and then it warmed up, the white tail had to be moved out and the black tail came in. So that's giving us a, a good indication of some of these environmental changes that are happening due to climate. Microteens, those little rodents, super important for figuring out what time you're in. Um, rodents reproduce very quickly, therefore they speciate very quickly and they can be used to really kind of find detail time um, at what age you're looking at. So these are super important for us to understand the stratigraphy of the cave. We find a lot of rabbits. Um, and another important lagomorph that we find is the pika. And the pika are known from boreal montane areas. They're, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of the, they're, we find them out in Wyoming in the mountains. And that's the closest that we find them today. So they're not known from the Black Hills today. So this is suggesting again, a lot cooler, a lot drier um, for this particular cave. Um, we find horse, which is fossil horse. I think this horse was dated to 30,000 years old and we have found camel bones. And Sharon, um, while, you're on the, while you're on the, starting to get into the megafauna and the horse and yeah. the camel, um, I do want to bring up again, sort of, you know, why you're looking at the cave sites themselves and why not just looking at the mammoth site. It is because the mammoth site Although it does have a lot of different taxa, you don't get very many of the small ones. Is that correct? 
Right, so we do find some small ta taxa, but we really don't find very much. Um, and so the small taxa really get at that detailed picture. Large megafauna, they move great distances. Um, they tend to migrate. They're around for a really long time. Whereas the small species, they tend to be more isolated in areas in some cases. They tend to speciate more quickly and they tend to have a better representation of what's going on in the local um, biota and the, the local climate and um, really kind of get out of what's happening in that particular habitat. So um, the microfauna are very crucial for getting a really good picture of what you're looking at um, through time. And so the mammocyte, what's great about that is it, it does cover 50,000 years, but the ice age was a lot longer than 50,000 years. And so um, we really need to also get at other t aspects of the ice age and other periods of time. So we can start sure. filling in that holes in time with other caves and hopefully to the point where they're overlapping a little bit, we can get a lot clearer picture of what's going on in the Black Hills through the entire ice age. Great, let's, uh, let's go over to David and see what other questions might be building up. Sure, we've got a few questions. Uh, the first one, while we're on the subject of the micro taxa, uh, Grant has asked, what sort of bats do you find? That I don't remember. <laughs> um, I know we find four different species. Um, I don't remember exactly which ones they were. I think I even asked Jim that recently and he um, didn't quite remember either. Uh, if anybody's interested in looking at bat taxa a little bit more closely, I'm sure we have a lot for them to kind of peruse. <laughs> And then we got a question. This is one about the actual, the, the, the mammoth site and the, the facility there. This is a question from Steve on Facebook, who says, in 1988, we were told that the fossils would be hung from the support beams in the ceiling so that the mammoths would stay in their original location. Uh, when we were there last year, they didn't know anything about this. Any input on that? I have never heard that. Um, but what I can say is that that would not be possible. Uh, the bones at the mammocyte are very delicate. Uh, they have not had the mineral replacement that we see with dinosaur bones. And so they're actually softer than the surrounding sediment. One of the things that we strive for at the site is trying to find ways to preserve them as best as we can. Um, these bones in certain cases can be as delicate as something that's powder and you look at it wrong and it can fall apart. Um, so we are using um, paraloid right now to try to preserve the bones from the inside out, but those bones are will never probably be in the state where we could even articulate them into a skeleton for display. So having them hang from the ceiling is not something that would really be feasible. One of the things that I'm trying to do to kind of give that same sort of feel is find a good way of 3D scanning the bone bed itself. And so that you can digitally put yourself in the bone bed and see the changes of excavation through time. So that would clearly be something that would have to, that we couldn't go back in time to do, but we could do going forward in time through the future. Gotcha. And then we have one other uh, lingering question about mammoths. This is from Byron who asks, uh, how does the brain size of mammoths compare with modern elephants? I would say they're probably similar. I haven't looked at them directly, but they're probably about similar in size. I've, I've looked at an elephant skull. I've looked at the internal portion of an elephant skull. I've unfortunately looked at the internal portion of a mammoth skull. Uh, <laughs> due to the mammoth skull falling apart, but they, they look roughly about the same size for brain. Um, most of the skulls, so you see a mammoth skull or an elephant skull, they look very enormous. And most of the space in the skull is actually sinus cavity. So they have the giant trunk. Well, that trunk has a lot of space on the inside to kind of fill in where they're going to be breathing. So that sinus cavity is kind of like a honeycomb structure. So most of the skull is filled up in that honeycomb structure. And what's kind of a neat tidbit is when a mammoth's 
started to decay probably at the mammoth site, that honeycomb structure in the skull would probably fill up with gases from the brain decomposing and other parts of the body decomposing and that skull probably would have kind of floated along um, on top of the water a bit in the site. So we see a lot of the skulls being separated out from the bodies. <laughs> gotcha. Thanks for answering this. Sharon, if you want to go ahead and work through a few more slides, we'll see if we get more questions. Sure. So um, we find camel too, so we know the site. Um, it's dated about 40,000. One of the unique things too is that we find bison. You go, okay, well, we have bison in the Black Hills today. Yes, we do. Uh, but this bison bone that we found at Persistence is a larger bison. Uh, it's probably bison antiquus. And it kind of fits into more climatic research that the mammoth site's involved with in conjunction with the newly Dr. Jeff Martin um, from Texas A&M. And he's, his research is looking at how bison changes in size in relation to climate change. So when it gets warmer, you get smaller bison. And so we see this kind of directly related. He's even looked at wind cave bison at the park over the last 50 years and seen a correlation with warming changes and a decrease in bison size. So this not only impacts how animals react to climate, but this could also impact such things as the bison meat industry. So how does that affect, if we go forward, how does that affect the meat industry going forward? So not only do, does our research look at the past, but it can also involve components of helping the economy and helping us understand our environments going forward. So we see, we start to get this little bit of a picture of there's different animals we're finding in caves. They're suggesting different environmental environment than we see today. It's, it's, um, we're seeing a situation where it was probably more open land. Um, we, we see these different changes kind of going on. But again, these are all little snapshots. And so we need to really kind of get at overlapping these pictures to get the overall view of what's going on in the ice age. So, and this is just kind of a, a short figure kind of jumping back to where we were with the mammoth site. So the mammoth site was 190 to 140,000, but we have a cave that's been excavated and been written up, Salamander Cave, that's also on Wind Cave National Park property, that's dated to 252,000. We talk about Persistence Cave, which is the cave I just introduced, and that's 40,000, though we have some specimens that are dating at 11,000, but we're not getting that full glacial, that little dip yet at Persistence Cave. Currently, we're doing more research. Um, another cave that we're calling Parker's Pit Cave, that's dating to about 14,000. There's Don's Gooseberry Pit, which is next door to Parker's Pit. That's about 18,000. And I have on there Wind Cave Pine Martin at about 11,000. So just last year, a crew at Wind Cave National Park went out to survey Wind Cave. So they went to the far reaches of Wind Cave and on the very, very edge of it and very new territory of the cave, they came across a complete Pine Martin skeleton that still had some bits of jerky on it. You see two little arrows down at the bottom of the picture. Blaine, do you know what those are? Look like copper lights. Yeah, they're copper lights. And so we had them take this specimen out and we preserved it here at the mammoth site as best we could. Now to get to this point in the cave is a lot of work. It's pretty, pretty treacherous. And so this kind of got a little bit broken up on the way out. So we're looking at better methods of removing specimens if we foresee them to be important. But this guy dates to, um, what did I say? Yeah, 11,000 or so years ago. And what's neat is this is on the edge of the cave that's starting to get closer to persistence. So did this animal come in from a separate entrance into Wing Cave? Or is this animal coming in from a separate entrance originally in persistence cave and do those two caves connect so there, is there soft tissue preserved yeah all right there is some soft tissue preserved yep That's and there's good. another skeleton 
So this is brand new research, mm -hmm. brand new. So um, super exciting. Uh, they have not found any fossils this far into Wind Cave at all, ever. All right. Yeah, I remember going on the, the tour of Wind Cave and them talking about there not being any fossils when I asked. And of course I was thinking, well, you haven't looked everywhere yet. So. Right. <laughs> and this is, you know, unexplored cave area. Like there's still a lot more of Wind Cave to be mapped. Um, but COVID has prevented um, cavers from really getting back to surveying. So mm -hmm. Um, one of my goals is kind of bridge surveying cave explorers and paleontology a little bit, trying to keep cavers interested in paleontology and being aware of fossils and things as they go, because they have one directive and they're viewed on that. And so I just want them to, you know, find ways of opening their eyes to, hey, when I come across something like this, maybe it's important. Let's take a snapshot of it. Yeah, definitely. So, and that's kind of what happened here is they stumbled across it, said, oh, I've never seen this skeleton or a skeleton here in Wing Cave. This must be important and took a picture and then reached out to us. So it's So how far of a exciting. range extension is that? Um, I, for a Pine Martin? Yeah, are they there today? They are, have been reintroduced today. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if they were here historically, so I don't know if they were here like in the 1800s, but they were here 40,000 years ago or so. So Persistence Cave has Pine Martin material. Okay. Well, David, just jump in if you have any questions. I'm kind of out of whack on the time since we got started late. Oh, no problem. Yeah, we started about 15 minutes late. So we're, we're nearing uh, the end of where we would normally wrap it up. We do have a couple other questions waiting in the wings here that I can ask. Uh, the first on from Dick on Facebook who asks, you also have woolly mammoths at the site. Any idea about their geologic age? So we do have woolies. Uh, well, we believe we have at least one, maybe two or three woolies. Um, they are typically found closer to that 140,000 year mark um, based on where they are stratigraphically in the bone bed. Um, and then that would kind of put us towards that full glacial, which is a little bit cooler, which would make more sense um, because they have that heavy fur, heavy wool. Um, and so but beyond that, we haven't really found too much that says woolly beyond the, the skull and then a couple other little elements. Gotcha, gotcha. And then we've got one other question waiting to be asked here. And it is from Grant, who loves to ask about stable isotope work, who asks how much stable isotope work has been done on the mammoth site or on these other caves you're discussing? Not much. Um, and that's just what we're starting to do with the USGS. So that was just done. The samples were just collected a couple weeks ago. And so I, we don't know any results yet. Um, as for the caves, we haven't done that. I know of uh, the site hasn't done any stable isotope stuff that I know of. So Sharon, I'm, I'm guessing that the stable isotope work that's being done is on the sediments. Has stable isotope work been done on the teeth? No, but isn't that what Matt's going to start doing? Ah, yes. Matthews? So we have a project that's in the in the works with one of our graduate students here at ETSU. That's right. So that's in the works too, Grant. I have another question, Sharon. David probably has one too. But um, if this was during the previous full glacial, not the last one we had, but the one before that, so where was the ice? at that time around the Black Hills? And was this like a hot tub for them? So the ice would have been relatively low. I don't know exactly where the reaches of it were, um, but this would definitely be a nice area for them to kind of go and feed. Uh, the water was relatively warm, so there would definitely be fresh grass all around the edges and would be a very like 
keen spot. I mean, if I were to go out on vacation or go out and I see this like buffet set out for me and this hot pool of water to go relax in, I am going to take my time and enjoy it. So I could definitely see how this would be a very enticing place for mammoths to go. Yeah, um, so mammoths something... like elephants like to swim. I mean, they have you know, a built-in snorkel and they have that body mass to help them float, all that fat to help them float. So they're pretty keen swimmers. So I could see them easily wanting to go in the water. And I mean, it's something that people might not realize unless they visited, but the water there is, is warm. It stays warm year round. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. and we still have a number of natural springs that are warm. Um, and in the wintertime, you can see the steam running of you know, just coming off the river in town. Right. So it, it, there's a lot of water. We do get a lot of water um, in hot springs. David, any more? That's all the questions that we have. All right. Sounds good. We could talk about the bear for just a second. Sure. And then, I mean, the I guess the spoiler there is that we have an adult and uh, a juvenile. Mm-hmm. And, but we don't have much of one of those skeletons. So we know that even before, even when the original description was done, we actually have some of both from that original description. Um, but I'm wondering if you all have an idea of where the rest of the second skeleton might be. It seems to me that both of the individuals are coming out from our west end of the sinkhole, which is what we interpret to be the shallow end of the sinkhole. Um, we have yet to find any ma uh, bare bones on the other side of mm -hmm. the site. That doesn't mean that they can't be there, but I highly anticipate finding more where we're currently excavating. Um, this is under what we call V-skull, so a mammoth skull that we pulled out a few years ago, about five, six years ago, um, and that's where we came across the, the other humerus. So both the adult giant short face bear and the juvenile giant short face bear humeri are found within about seven to eight feet of each other. And I mean, stratigraphically different layers, but pretty close in the same um, just general region of the site. And so, so since we're working in that area now, you think that it's possible you're going to find more this year, next year, possibly? Possibly. Um, we have one individual that is actively excavating in that area, right? To, lately, she's been working on cleaning up a beautiful mammoth tusk and exposing that. It's just over nine feet, in, but it is one of our better preserved mammoth tusks. So she's been fine detailing that out a bit, but um, I highly anticipate her working in that area. We call it, we, her name is Biz and we call it Disneyland. So that's kind of her little domain. So <laughs> she will be actively working there as much as possible. Biz is Canadian. Uh, and so she does have to go back to Canada at some point. Uh, and with COVID restrictions, it's kind of hard for that back and forth between the US and Canada. So we'll just have to see going forward. Um, it, Today's the last day for the summer internship program. Uh, and so we see a decrease in the amount of excavation work that we do. Uh, my time is filled up with many other things besides excavating. So um, we do see a slight dip in the amount of work. We are keeping two interns on uh, for another month or two to just kind of help us um, clean up and get stuff organized at the site and in the bone bed um, and better preserve some of the specimens that we've exposed this summer. But nice. uh, I do anticipate putting interns in, in that general area of the west end of the bone bed uh, next summer. All right, that sounds awesome. Yeah, I'm definitely excited about you know, more bear. And uh, you know, now that we know the age of the site, that's mm -hmm. kind of an exciting time. We don't have a lot of giant short-faced bears from that time frame, represented by skeletons. And for those who uh, love the giant short faced bear, this is, or at least one of the specimens, is a very large one. So it's definitely worth going <clears throat> to see that as well. Yeah, when you compare the humerus of the bear specimen that we found next to the Nebraska specimen, which I believe is the largest, it's just slightly right small. Right there, yeah. yeah. 
All right. Well, we will wrap it up. Sharon, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. This was fun. Anything else, David? I think that's it. We will be back again next uh, next week with more talks. Is that right, Blaine? Yep, we'll be back next week. Uh, still working on finalizing that one. All I know right. we didn't get to cover absolutely everything, Sharon, that you guys are doing up at the, the Mammoth site. There's lots of other work going on too, on bison and, and whatnot. But uh, we'll have you on another time, perhaps, to talk about That'd that. Great. I want to All talk right. more about caves. I know, me too. All right. Thanks again. We'll talk to you later.